Well, Joe Mullings, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here. Thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's amazing that we haven't talked uh, in the past, even just bumped into each other here and there. I have seen you uh, at conferences. It's hard to, to miss the the lights and the cameras and all the action going on on your uh, your sites. It's really an impressive operation. So I want to want to get into that, obviously, in the middle of this conversation. But I like to start these talks just figuring out how people found their way into this very cool industry of ours. Uh, you are an engineer by education. Have you ever, were you working as an engineer at yeah. one point? Yep, I did about two and a half, three, uh, actually three years as an engineer. I started out uh, at a University of Dayton, Ohio, a mechanical engineer, and I worked for a company called Laurel Fairchild back in Syosset, New York, in Long Island. Uh -oh. uh, electro optics and primarily target acquisition systems, heads up displays that you see in the front of a jet in the uh, through the windscreen. Uh, so I worked on those for a few years, and then I went to work for a Swiss screw machine company uh, as a marketing guy, uh, product development engineer marketing, and then got out of engineering after that, went to the dark side of recruiting. <laughs> Talk to, I love talking about these transitions. What, uh, what happened? Why did you decide not to be an engineer? Anymore? Oh, God. I, well, I, I still am an engineer. You know, it's like when you tell somebody they were in the Marines. No, they're always a Marine, right? So <laughs> <laughs> I'm always an engineer. I look at everything like an engineer. I have designed my businesses like an engineer. Uh, my workflow in our organization, I look at raw materials, cost of goods, you know, workflow. Uh, engineering change notices, you know, like if I'm going to change one process to another. Um, but I, I worked in an aerospace company, and one day I was sitting around the table and with some really bright people. Uh, and, you know, the head of engineering was there, and um, he, was, he was half miserable in his job. And, and, and I was like, gosh, if, if, that's, if that's the bar that's set that I have to hit, I'm not sure that's what I want to aspire to. No. I didn't know the startup world at the time. You know, startups were not cool in 1984, 85, 86. Um, when I was an engineer, I got out of school in 84. And so I just, uh, I bailed. You know, I got out of the business and uh, rolled around in life for a couple of years. That's a story for another time. And then um, walked into a headhunter's office one day, Sebastian Lavolsi, and said, Seb, find me a job. And, um, after about two hours of an interview, he says, do you ever think about doing this? And I said, mm, not really, but how much did your top sales guy make last year? He told me, I said, when do I start? And so that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's how I got started. That's, that's a very good reason to make the transition. That's, mm -hmm. And that's an interesting story, too. I had a similar experience with, uh, with newspapers. Um, I was in, started in newspapers and saw people in their, my age now, 40s and 50s, they, felt, they looked unhappy and stuck. And I was like, that's what I'm working toward. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like that's the dream right there. Not all of them, of course, but of course, some of them. And uh, I'm glad I made the change. Same. So, how did you then? Uh, did you immediately start working in medtech? Because when you when you began doing uh, search and recruiting, mm -hmm. I think medtech was really just starting to emerge. Obviously, Medtronic was around. The big ones were around, right. but. Right. Startups hadn't become a thing yet. Yeah, so I started out um, the the desk that uh, the uh, owner put me on, Sebastian put me on, was uh, just a general engineering desk since that was right in my you know in my back pocket. But in particular, you ready for this? Valves in the aerospace industry. That was my desk specialty. <laughs> so you know Parker Hannafin, uh, Murata Scientific. Uh, Moog up in uh, 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 Skinny Atlas or Aurora, New York, actually. And, and then there was this one little company called Valcor Engineering in Springfield, New Jersey. And Valcor, beside doing aerospace valves, they also did small valves for the scientific instrumentation industry and not quite medical device. And so I struck up this great conversation with the principal of his name was Lee Walters, still near and dear to my heart. And he was a and I was a young guy and I called him as a headhunter. You called unsolicited into the companies. And he said, uh, uh, I started pitching to him and uh, he said, well, I don't need a headhunter. And, uh, and uh, the phone went dead and I called him back. I said, we must have got disconnected. He said, no, I hung up on you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I stayed on the phone with him or I kept him on the phone and he gave me my first opening. It was like this slot that he couldn't fill in Valcor Scientific was these little micrometering valves. He said, if you can fill this, we'll see what happens. And, you know, you know, worked my tail off, filled it. 
And then uh, from there, he was my first big client, and we ended up becoming good friends after that. And he got me into med tech because from there, I had to obviously recruit in all of these other micrometering valve companies up in the Northeast. Uh -huh. And then I started looking at it, and I'm like, wait a minute, this is an industry that the population's going to continue to get old. Um, it's got to, and again, I'm an engineer, I, I prefaced that before I started this. Um, Technology is always going to seek your higher ground. Um, it's got a built-in modulating governor to it, meaning it'll never grow too fast and it'll never therefore crash and burn like dot-com or the mortgage bu bubble. And, you know, people are always going to get sick. So there's something to this. And I knew the barrier to entry was going to be very high because the more research I did into it, I saw that, you know, you had different therapies, obviously, you know, neuro, interventional cardiology, ortho, and then all the functional roles, and you had to understand the disease states. So I said, if I start a search firm that is only focused on med tech, I'm going to have no competition because it's too darn hard. Wow. And then uh, that's what kicked it off to a 30 plus person firm today exclusively in, you know, med tech, which I call health tech today, actually, and we mm -hmm. can dig into that further. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I, and I love those moments. I mean, there must have been a moment when you sat there wondering what happened to the phone line and then debating whether or not to make that call back. And what happens if you don't make that call back? That's right. It's amazing. That's right. So uh, you, you've, you've created many great vehicles to, to tell med tech stories. I know you're an engineer and you look at it from an engineering perspective, but you, you must, and this is a softball question, but you must have a real passion for this, this industry. Oh Did my that God. Yeah. develop instantly or, or did it develop over time as you came to know the people in it? Med tech, you mean? Yes. Yeah. I think it's like anything. Romantically, we want to think about love at first sight. And, and I'm not yeah. sure if that's really true. I think retrospectively, when you're in a relationship with something and eventually turns into a deep love, you could rationalize it as, as love at first sight. But I, I think I was really intrigued with what they were doing and all the different ways to navigate the human body. And when I first taught my initial partner, Jim Weber, I said, think about it like a house, like you have an electrical system, got that, then you have the ortho system, which is the studs, and then you have the plumbing, which is sort of the cardiovascular vascular system. And then when you start digging into that, and if I wasn't going to be an engineer, I was going to be a home builder. So it all started to get together for me. And then over time, I, I fell in love with the people because while they all went to work for a paycheck, I think without exception, every single one of them were there for a higher calling because they could always make more money in another industry. But they were always reverting back, even in their selfish, most selfish moments, reverting back to the patient. Like there was a mission everybody was on. So I think that also continues to um, intrigue me and drive me forward with nearly every project I bring out of the ground in all my companies that are related to health tech and med tech. That's really well said. Let's talk a bit about sort of the state of, of the med tech job market uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how has it been changed or has it been changed by the last year and a half by the pandemic? And, and are the changes lasting? Yeah. Or great, are great they question. fleeting? Yeah. No, they're, they're here to, they're here to look. I, I think there was a movement towards certain behaviors that clearly were accelerated with um, the, the situation we're in right now with the pandemic. Uh, you know, I had gone on the record years ago that I think um, the salesperson in med tech was going to be compromised sooner than later. Uh, I had talked about it, put out a big article about three years ago. I got a lot of heat on about being Amazoned out of the business, uh, especially in the commodity type businesses. It just didn't make sense for the cost that healthcare was uh, incurring in the United States, 18% of our GDP. So, you know, ultimately you were going to be able to Amazon your medical, uh, your, your consumable medical devices for the most part. And if you weren't adding tremendous clinical value at the bedside or to the clinician, you were going to be compromised. Uh, so I think that's been accelerated. I think the virtual engagement now and not being able to walk into ORs or ICUs, CCUs, cath labs even, that's going to declare itself differently. So the sales function and how we interact with the point of sale, I think is gonna change. So that's one. Um, the acceleration of virtual, uh, I think in fact, Massachusetts is the first state for reimbursement, you know, not surprised on the virtual engagement with a clinician, physician, your doctor, that's changing dramatically. You know, you've got Proximy and you've got uh, 
Lavongo, uh, you know, uh, Joe DeVivo brought uh, his organization bought by them in touch and then Avail Med Systems. You've got this virtual engagement, this peer to peer network going on right now virtually uh, that is going to dramatically change um, how the med tech industry is going to sell demo uh, install. I was just uh, at Transenterics last week up in North Carolina. Um, you know, uh, Anthony is doing unbelievable things with them. Keep your eyes on them. Uh, but they, 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 because they were installing a robot in Japan, I think it was, had to build a system on site to install the robot. Now they've got an entire product line that allows them virtually to proctor and install their robot. Corindus did it, uh, I think, also in Asia. Doug Teeny and his team installed mm -hmm. a full Corindus platform without ever stepping foot. So wow. I think that's going to change the landscape a lot. Um, and then the patient empowered health, I think finally the public, and it'll be a certain demographic psychographic. I think the public now is pushing into managing their own health rather than being pulled into health by disease. So I think this pandemic has made a sensitivity around how fragile we all are. And you're going to start to see passive patient monitoring, which are going to be intelligent consumer devices. Um, now start to creep into our lives, whether it's an intelligent toilet bowl or an intelligent toothbrush, you know, on the toilet bowl, the gut biome and the toothbrush gum health to, tied directly to cardiovascular disease to passive patient monitoring. And then services will now come around the aggregation of that data. And I wrote about this last week where you may take a 23 and me like test, see what you're predisposed for. And, um, you know, uh, genetics loads the gun, lifestyle and environment fire it. And so now you're going to start to see people really taking ownership of their health and preemptively getting ahead of what they're predisposed for. And you're going to see med tech lean into that. You know, keep in mind, Johnson and Johnson's a consumer products company. Don't count them out into maybe being the first into, into the intelligent consumer devices, because they out of all the med tech giants are the real consumer products company. Um, it's why you see Google with Fitbit and leaning in and, mm -hmm. you know, Amazon with what is it, Whoop. And there's going to, Tom, there's a rush going on right now if you're paying attention to the passive consumer slash patient monitoring before they have to become a patient. I think that is going to dramatically change the health tech scene over the next three to four years. That's it, yeah. And I know Collar, the, the, the bathroom company, the faucet company, has their own med tech unit now that they're building. Best Buy. Uh, yeah, Best Buy. So how does this, going back to the job market, is this the best time to be going into med tech because yes. there's all of these opportunities or is it becoming more challenging because there's it's going the to be a lot time. more competition? The best it's time. the best time. I just I was just presenting here yesterday. And so one of the things that's really cool about what's happening right now is forever, med tech has been primarily an analog and a single device. Sure, there are other platforms, imaging and digital previous to this, but let's look at it on a whole. It's been a catheter or it's been an endolapro device, but it's been a non-connected single use device that um, basically you got your use out of it and you were done. And there weren't a lot of software engineers in med tech in, in, in contextual relative terms. And there weren't a lot of advanced double E firmware system level people. It was primarily a mechanical manufacturing operations quality brilliant people but now what you've got is you've got because it hasn't been a native digital play you've got all this other great talent these people who don't want to work on drones anymore they want to make a robot or a digital system that's going to save their grandmother right as i as we started out our conversation there are people who want to aspire more than keeping somebody on a browser for 42 more seconds <laughs> and, and 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 i think they're all going to start to rush in and what does that mean that means that the product development platforms are going to start to expand dramatically. And we're going to be hiring more people that we never considered before because MedTech's been a closed ecosystem from a talent perspective. If you weren't in MedTech before and you tried to break into it 10 years into your career, even from military or DOD work, it was really hard unless you were like in image processing or you were in some advanced data, well, not even data analytics. So I think what you're going to see now is people are going to get out of college and know it's cool 
to go be an engineer or a marketing person in health tech. And you're going to see me stop using it as med tech. It's going to be cool because look who just saved the world. Yeah, that, that, that's an awesome point. And, and, and there's no reason we can't have the cachet that went with, I'm going to work at Google or I'm going to work at Amazon. I'm going look to work who just Facebook. saved the world, man. Scientists yeah. and engineers. Yep, that's right. Great point. So then people who are looking to get jobs, to find new jobs, to, to find better jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you're a big pro a proponent of building brand, and I think you've moved on beyond using the brand term to, uh, to, to subject expert. Talk, talk a bit about how positioning yourself for a better job has changed. Mm -hmm. how, how, how should people be doing it? I think you're, you're kind of the if I'm if I'm looking to get fit and I'm kind of looking at this this triathlete, in that in this regard, I think you're a triathlete. You're going you're doing so much on the social media side that we can talk about later. But what lessons should people take away from some of the things that you're doing to make themselves uh, more attractive? Yeah. So you know it it, it it comes down to creating an awareness and attention around what you do, and that that model has held true. It, it, you know, previous Tom, previous to the last couple of years, it's called networking. But now we call it branding, right? So the That's stuff, right. the stuff's the same. It's just, you know, now it's about scalability. So in the past, when you networked, it was usually a one-to-one -one peer to peer, and maybe one person knew three people, but that nodal relationship was really one-to-one. -one. So now if you think about networking, uh, and we can call, we can slide into branding on that and, and, and subject matter expertise, then scale to subject matter leadership, then scale to voice of an industry you're really just looking at networking and you're networking and giving people a reason to pay attention to you, right? So, so if you're looking for a, not necessarily looking for a new job, you should, you should be branding yourself and networking when you don't need it. And that's mm -hmm. the advice I give to people is like, because when you, when you start networking and branding yourself um, and there's, there's an urgency to it, it does not come off well mm -hmm. at all. Um, so that's the first thing. I'd be start building my network and or brand and or expanding my reputation of who I am already. So when people come to me about branding, I'm like, no, no, put that word out the door. Let's call it, let's just expand your subject matter expertise and build your reputation around your expertise that you have. Whether it's hosting, you know, like dev device talks or you're a software engineer or you're a great marketing person. And the way you do that is right now, today at least, and I don't think this will change, this is the beauty of LinkedIn. LinkedIn is an education platform. It's not a job board. It's not a job posting board. If you sit back and you give it a real analytical perspective, it's an education platform. And the IQ on that platform versus other socials is just far and away higher on, on average. So therefore, if you, if you if you align your content with trying to teach people things without being pedantic and you know talking down but just say hey here's what i do here's what i'm really good at let me write a uh, article about it let me take an article in a magazine or a white paper and put it down so like who is it einstein who said it if you can't describe some complex feature simply then you really don't understand that, right? So educate the market. That that would be the that would be one thing. And then what's coming to Tom, and this leans into that, is I can't wait for the day, and I'm going to be leading the charge that companies realize you're more than your resume, hmm. and you're going to start seeing products coming out that will, by permission, allow individuals to sure put out their resume, but then put out some body of work that demonstrate they're more than the static resume that wasn't written specifically for that opening. Um, I think that's going to be a good branding opportunity in general as well. So I don't know if I answered your question, but it's sort of like a, fun, a philosophical perspective. No, you did. And, and I do think you're right. It's you, you shouldn't wait until you need that new job to, to or, or until you want to change. I don't want to make it sound like you're grasping for something else, but I think people do uh, need to get themselves out there. And, and that's why having media like yours and, and, and device talks, I think it is helpful for, for everybody. Um, in your own postings, you, mm -hmm. you brought up before that you're, you mentioned uh, Amazon moving into med tech. Some people like that stuff. Some people don't. Do you like reading that sort of material? Do you, when you're posting something, 
do you take into account that this is going to be unpopular but well read do you, you obviously don't just want to say what what other people want to want to hear how do you sort of know when you're saying something important but you're doing it in a way that's not going to cost you or, or can you just not be afraid of that second part well i have a couple um rules i i always try not to insult somebody on my posting um that doesn't mean that i don't want somebody to disagree with me right i i do like critical thinking um there's an interesting approach is it's hard to tell the truth but it's easy not to lie and so i always try and approach my postings that way i, I try not to talk poorly about people um but i always try and talk about subjects that i want you to think about provocatively you know generally when i talk about amazon entering um or i talk about you know uh, and especially amazon let's just go back to sales right because i i don't think i had one one intentionally um and i've been attacked a bunch of times online uh one intentional attack of you don't know what you're talking about because it's so obvious that the commodity side of healthcare is going to be compromised by the best supply chain company in the world who already is buying into the pharmaceutical pharmacy business, who is already getting into insurance business, who already is the most trusted brand in the world, digitally online. And if you can't look at that and extrapolate out that they're going to walk into this business, it's not going to be an Amazon rep showing up in the OR. Yeah. Right. So, so in that case, I put out what I think I've been in the business 30 years, more than 7,000 placements have been trusted by most of the CXOs in the industry. I get to sit in meetings that I'm blessed to sit in. I can sort of connect the dots, you know, I'm Tom Brady of headhunting, right? I can see patterns occur <laughs> on the field, right? See the open receiver, sure. Yeah, and then so, yeah. you know, that's what I put out. And I, I hopefully I put out thoughtful things for people to go, huh, I never thought of that way, or I thought about it, but I didn't know how to put it into words. Well, you had the CEO of Proxmi on your show, one of your shows a couple of months ago. And that's a space actually that I think that you, you are seeing some great debate. We've talked to Avail and Explorer, and I'd love to talk to Proxmi on it. We've swapped emails. The, 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 the remote sales rep in the OR or remote connection to the OR. There are, there are sales reps out there and, and, and surgeons out there who say there's no way I can deal do this without a, a rep in the room. But there seems to be a real push toward these remote technologies. I'd love to understand what you're saying. I mean, you're, you're on the front lines talking to the people who hire the sales reps and the sales reps themselves. How do you see that, that sort of playing out? Hmm. So I, I think it's important not to not to put it all, the, the entire category into replacing the sales rep. So I think when you look at the category, it's virtual engagement. So let's mm -hmm. start there. And now you can break that down into different categories. There, there's virtual engagement of people who are at home who have chronic care illness, which is 80% of that 18% of our GDP, who don't need to go to the doctor or have a hard time because of ambulatory issues getting to the doctor. However, I still need to have a look at their foot ulcer, or I still need to look at their, uh, they have to check in with me. Well, maybe a device like InTouch, which is part of Livongo, which is part of Teladoc now, is the right solution for that tele-engagement. And it's a different platform than Approximy, which is maybe a little bit more about peer-to-peer -peer scrubbing, maybe more about education, uh, maybe more about demo or, listen, not every interaction from a clinician's perspective is a critical interaction. But what if I could increase my adoptability and usability of a relatively new product and I'm there on call as needed, mm -hmm. right? Because economically, it does not make sense to put a $400,000 a year rep out to make three calls a day to lean in. That's an antiquated system based on an analog approach. Does, should that disappear? No, but I think we should have a tiered system of engagement and support on behalf of the patient, not the doctor, on behalf mm -hmm. of the patient in this ecosystem. So, you know, Avail is one platform, Proximy is another, In Touch with Joe is another. I, I think they all have a space and there's room for all of them in there because they're sort of solving different problems to keep access high, cost low, outcomes 
amazing. And that's how you have to look at your health tech moving forward. That's a great point. Uh, just focusing one more question on, yeah. on recruiting in the job market, because I want to get into your portfolio. But uh, last year, after the killing of George Floyd, many med tech CEOs stood up and made statements and made promises to, to, to deliver diversity and to make changes. Some were already doing that. Many were already doing that, to be fair. Uh, how What's happened over the last 10 months? Have you Do you see a palpable move toward making our, our med tech workforce look more like the general population? That's a tough one. You know, this is, um, I had Kwame Olmer on uh, when I was, uh, when we had, what was it, the last AdvaMed in Boston. He's uh, one of the founders of MedTech Color. We're also a big supporter, a platinum supporter of MedTech Color. So mm -hmm. um, I, like all MedTech companies, are supportive of uh, uh, inclusivity. Yeah, that, that, that's critically important. Um, I think there's a ton more work to do there uh, on that uh, uh, inclusivity. You know, you get into the bait of the debate of uh, a quality of opportunity and then a quality of outcomes, right? So I don't think any um, uh, minority uh, population is interested in a quality of outcomes. I think all they want is a fair shot on goal on a quality of opportunity. So that that's a I think that's a position for everybody's sake. Uh, that we should start with. Now, a quality of outcomes um, is certainly something that is legislated and I disagree with. I know what the intention of it is. Um, but the, the, the toughest part of this is, and, and I have the numbers in house because we were asked about this recently. When we mm -hmm. broke down the 350 searches we did last year successfully, I think more than 30% of them were female. Right, uh, I think less than eight percent were people of color, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that indexes, if you go to the professional ranks and above, right, four-year degree and above, that index is higher than the population of the industry. Mm -hmm. The challenge is, if we go down to just you know people of color, the challenge is is you know there's there's just not the population pool to pull from. So you're, yeah. putting, you're, putting a, you're putting a major ask on the executives who want to make sure that there's an equality of opportunity on the table. Yet there is a very small mm, population to pull from from pre-existing experience in med tech. First of all, think about that. You've been around this industry for a long time. And then it's never been the coolest industry to go into. And I know there's an aggressive push at the university level to get into that, right? So, so you've already got a constrained pipeline of candidates to go after. And we're not the only industry that is looking for, you know, inclusivity and equality. Right. And so if we're not the coolest in the industry to go into, and there's an incentive for the banking industry and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and other high tech industries to go after that, you know, diversity, uh, an underrepresented population, then we're competing in an area that we've got to figure out another way to accommodate uh, creating that opportunity for, um, you know, the less privileged population. So it's a tough one, man. It's a really, really tough one. And, you know, I'm, again, like, like other leaders in med tech, it's, it's, it's top agenda for us and all of yeah. our actions. Uh, you know, sounds like it needs 60% 60 of our uh, of, of our team females right mm -hmm. um, so and, and on on our team we've got you know a very diverse a very diverse uh, part of TMG companies very diverse but we do that it's a tough one but we do that competency rules right and then we want to try and make sure if we're in a situation where we can create an opportunity for somebody, if not but for, we always do that. Um, but I, I just think that underrepresented population just wants the fair shot on goal um, in regards to the privileged population. Uh, that just, you know, look, I was born on third base thinking I hit a triple just because I was born in the right place in the right zip code of the right skin color. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm, it's not lost on me that people are trying to get at bat from the dugout and they're just not getting a chance even to get at bat. 
It's good that we're having these conversations and we try to make it part of, it, of all of our discussions. And yeah. You're right. I think we need to start earlier on and really build the pipeline, but yeah. it's, it's good to talk about. What are, let's talk about what you're you're working on. You mentioned at the top that you're an engineer, that you have you make plans, you, you build out intentionally. What are you trying to build, or what are you building with with the Mullings Group? You've got you've got your interviews, you've got your your your, your true futures program. Uh, tell us a bit about your portfolio and and where are you working? What are you working toward? Hmm. Yeah, thanks for that opportunity. So, you know, TMG Search started 30 years ago. It was just my 30th uh, anniversary uh, in the middle of January. That was cool. I broke out some oh, original okay, notes right. and posted them online. I think it's got over 150 to 200,000 views now. And it's eerie because it's very close to who we are today. So I think that's <laughs> just a little lucky, right? Like, like bell bottoms come back around, you know, might have <laughs> changed a bit over the years. Um, so that's going really well. You know, we uh, more than 7,000 successful searches. You know, I think we're at least three and a half to four times uh, successful in those numbers uh, than any competitor near us. So we've been blessed that way and worked hard too with a great team. Uh, we've got True Future, which is a docu-series. We were in our fourth season now. We've been around the country. We've been to Israel. We've been to Germany. We've been to the UK, highlighting the amazing people, technologies, and cultures that make up our med tech, health tech industry, uh, that, that's going extraordinarily well. So think of Anthony Bourdain traveling the world, sitting with cool people. I get to play that role. Um, <laughs> <laughs> only we're, we're, we're sitting in cafes and beach, beaches in Israel and Tel Aviv talking about the tech and what these great people are bringing to the market. So um, that's, that's one. And then TMG 360, uh, we just launched that uh, this year. And that is intended to be directed at the emerging tech companies in the health tech world that are um, underrepresented uh, in the industry uh, because there are no other outlets that are either tuned into this heavy digital push moving forward, um, meaning imaging, navigation, robotics, AI, VR, and you know, which is a decent part of our search business um, core base, but also telling the stories about these entrepreneurs and getting in deep and offering them a multi-modality level as they look for financing or they look for uh, 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 JVs um, or they look for clinical trial recruitment. Um, and we're highlighting them and working with them. And then we're also helping them build their brands. So we're coming in and giving them guidance on how to get awareness and tension online, on how to tell their story, on how to have world-class content development that we can facilitate through Dragonfly Stories, our full media company. And um, we've, I think we've got our first six customers as soon as we opened our doors, which wow. is great. So are, are you a media, is 360 a, a media company yeah. or a, it's, not a, it's not a marketing firm or it's not a marketing firm. It's not a PR firm. It's, we call it a communications company. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, um, it's out in the public domain. So uh, Christy Kennedy, who was with MedTech Strategist, uh, came over and she's uh, 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 a COO there. Uh, Kayleen, who also came over from MedTech Strategist, uh, was one of the, uh, I think, senior editors there. She's here yep. as a vice president. So I know, them. I know them both well. They're, they're excellent people. Great people. So we, and we have mad respect for MedTech strategists and we're a big customer of theirs. We just, we just saw the ability to take that industry and bring it into a media forward um, platform that is gonna tell the stories that is, and, and we're there to tell stories first Tom. So we're, we're not there for you to write me a check. The check is gonna be a byproduct. The intention is to tell these amazing stories on a regular basis of these up and coming companies in health tech and give them a platform um, that if not before they would have ever had. So just one more thing. So there's probably a half a dozen people we're talking to now that are looking for financing. You can't go around and talk to VCs anymore, right? Because of the world we live in. And even when you could, it wasn't good use of your time because you were showing up at these shows like TCT and no venture people had time for you for the most part, right? right? But what if you came into a studio and or we can do it remote, we've done it remote, and we set you up and you tell your story. And we usually want somebody who's at least done their A round because they already have their pitch deck down, they've already took heavy fire, 
and we're setting up a studio that you can do live on LinkedIn, your pitch presentation to the entire industry. You better be ready. And you'll get one hour to give your pitch and we'll have Q&A in, in this studio. You'll have Q&A and you'll be able to do your pitch. And our intention eventually is to have the VCs tune in from the comfort of their offices in Sand Hill or wherever. And you will then have potentially spoke to or had 80, 90 VCs in the health tech, med tech world. So all this is indexing towards a media company. We wanna build the biggest health tech, med tech media company in the industry. With um, We've got the studio, we've got the talent, we've got the access, we've got the trust. So over the next five years, TMG Company's intention is to build the biggest health tech media company in the industry. Wow, that's interesting. And this and this was a plan that came forth before the lockdown, before the pandemic. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like it, it really synced up with that whole dynamic that we've all learned. To, it was it was when yeah. we started True Future around three years ago. We knew we wanted to create a uh, like what we wanted to do is what Oprah did um, in her business. What she did is she got into that media business, but she owns all her own studio. She owns all her own talent. Um, everything is in house because usually that's a 1099 world, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. But we have all that talent in house, all the editing rooms, all of the great talent on photography and lighting and studios and and back office. Uh, and our intention is to just put out mad content that people are interested in sort of under, understanding the stories on and then being able to connect the entrepreneurs, and the creators with the venture people with the strategics and the amount of lean in we have now is you know people are calling to want to be on the show all the time i mean the the acquisition by gtcr that just happened um with surgical specialties right we mm -hmm. right um greg who um we've worked with lucier before they reached out and said we want to be on the show and talk about the of course let's do it mm -hmm. right so yeah, we want to we want to continue to bring the amazing message of all the great things happening and give access to the small girl, small guy, where if not but for you couldn't get on the stage. We're 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 going to take down that entire barrier. If you don't have fifty thousand to go to a show because you're a startup, I'll get you every day. I have a hundred and something sets of thousand sets of eyes on me. I want to leverage that into technology, getting in front of people. Excellent. No, it's a great plan. I could I could talk for another half hour on that on that alone. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the times the times are certainly are a changing. So this has been great. It's been a lot of fun. I hope we can uh, we can do this again. Thanks Love for joining. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. You got it. Thanks, Tom.